Our Bible study this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Our focus will be from verses 7 to 12 of Matthew, chapter 5, but let me read from verse 1. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Amen. We have looked already at the first four Beatitudes, and we saw that this can be taken as a description of the character of the kingdom citizen, specifically in terms of posture toward God. Now we consider the next four Beatitudes, and as, as mentioned already, these seem to deal with the character of the kingdom citizen, particularly with respect to his posture towards his fellow man. And I think one way to think about it is like this. Having been filled, in verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Having been filled, this then is what overflows and becomes evident to those around. As we saw already, this is something of a transformation that takes place within and then becomes manifest outwardly towards others. But it carries with it that same startling, otherworldly quality. First of all, verse 7 of Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. The merciful here is a description of those who show mercy in the way that they treat others. Not just sporadic acts of mercy, but these, these are acts of mercy that are continuously displayed and evident. This is mercy that flows from a uniform inclination of one's fundamental character. These are the merciful. They show mercy because they are merciful. And mercy has the idea of compassion or pity that is shown on one who is afflicted or who has no means to requite that mercy. It is compassion that is bestowed even when nothing is gained in return. That's the idea of mercy. The merciful are those who look on the downcast and suffering and help them even at cost to themselves, without getting anything in return, anything material. A good example of this is the Good Samaritan in the parable. You remember how the priest and the Levite walked past that man who was beaten and robbed, lying by the side of the road. The priest and the Levite saw his plight. They, they knew his condition. They knew that he was in need, but they ignored it. They walked past. They went their way. Not so the Samaritan. He saw, he had compassion, he had pity, and he helped that man. He put him on his own donkey, paid for his care to the innkeeper, at cost to himself. He looked after the man who had need. He showed mercy on him. That's the idea here. But this is not mercy as a merely human characteristic. As with all the Beatitudes, there is a supernatural quality to this mercy. 
This is not to say at all that only Christians are merciful or only Christians show mercy. No, that's not the case. By common grace, even a fallen sinner can on occasion perform acts of mercy, at least outwardly. But this mercy here, the merciful, this is mentioned here particularly as a characteristic of the kingdom citizen because the kingdom citizen has a particular divine foundation for the mercy that he shows to others. This is a mercy that is reflective of and motivated by the mercy of God, the mercy which God bestows on sinners. So in a way, this beatitude answers to the very first one. This first beatitude of the second group of four answers to the first beatitude of the first group of four. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You remember we saw that the poor in spirit are those who are spiritually bankrupt, who can offer nothing to God, but only plead for His mercy. And being poor in spirit, pleading for mercy, they receive the compassion, the pity, the mercy of God. And having received the mercy of God, they themselves are transformed and they now show that mercy to others. That mercy overflows from within them and they become themselves merciful. It becomes part of this new life that we have in Christ. This is what the Apostle Paul speaks of in his epistles. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Kind, tender hearted, forgiving. These things are all in the same sort of sphere as mercy. And this is, again, a mercy a kindness, a tender-heartedness, a forgiveness that is motivated by God's action towards us, by God's mercy towards us. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, so also do the same to others. And then in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 verse 12, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. And again, the motivation goes back to what God has done. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Blessed are the merciful. Now the world might look down on this. It is often said that to get ahead in the world, what you need is not to be merciful, but to be ruthless. To get ahead in the world, you have to walk past the people who are in need, because you're on a mission to promote yourself. The world might look down on this idea that the merciful are blessed. But God pronounces the merciful blessed. Why is that? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now this again is not teaching that acts of mercy are somehow meritorious and rewarded by God. This is not teaching that God shows mercy on us because first we were merciful. Not at all. In fact, the very concept of mercy that we receive from God implies that we have done nothing to deserve it. Then what is the idea here? Why does the Beatitude say that the merciful are blessed because they shall obtain mercy? This is clearly looking forward to something in the future. And I believe this is looking forward to the consummation of that last day, when we receive mercy in its consummate sense. It's the sort of idea that we find in, in James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that hath showed no mercy. 
and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. It's the same sort of idea, but, but the flip side of it. Those who are not merciful will have judgment without mercy on that day. Those who are not merciful will not receive mercy. They will be judged by God in that final judgment. But what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 is that the merciful on that day when they stand before God, instead of receiving judgment unto condemnation, unto condemnation they will obtain mercy. And they will enter into everlasting life. In other words, the merciful are those who show by the very bent of their character that they have already received the mercy of God and are now living in dependence on that mercy which they have received. This mercy of God which comes to the fallen sinner is so transformative that to be merciful is the necessary consequence. So much so that if someone is not merciful, if someone does not have this character, then it is to be questioned whether he or she has ever actually received the mercy of God. That's the idea here. Blessed are the merciful, because they will be assured of receiving, obtaining mercy in the consummate sense on that day, while the unmerciful can have no such assurance. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. This is a description of those who are full of integrity, those who are honest, sincere. This is the opposite of hypocrisy. And remember, heart in the biblical usage refers to the whole of the inner life. Scripture indicates that from the heart proceeds all the rest of one's external life. Remember the proverb, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of the heart flows and issues forth all the rest of our lives. Or as Jesus himself said later in Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Out of the heart proceed all these things. So the pure in heart are pure within and without. They are pure within and that purity is then evident in every other aspect of their lives. In other words, this description, the pure in heart, refers to those who are without an ounce of hypocrisy in every area of life. They are perfectly pure, sincere, genuine. The pure in heart are those who act in accordance and conformity with God's law out of a pure heart, not just externally, but inwardly as well. Their whole being is conformed and being conformed continually to the law and the word of God. They are unlike the Pharisees, those hypocrites that the Lord Jesus rebuked in Matthew 23, verse 28. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. They appeared to be very pure on the outside, but they were like whitewashed sepulchres, not pure at all on the inside, but wicked and corrupt. The pure in heart are not like that. In all their dealings with God, they are pure. As we read in the Psalms, Psalm 24, Psalm 24, verse 3, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. In all their dealings with God, they are pure. And in all their dealings with man also, they are pure. First Peter chapter 1, in verse 22. 
seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. These are the pure in heart. And again, this is something that the world may well ridicule. Why the need to be pure in heart? The appearance of sincerity is all that matters to the world. You can get by simply by appearing to be sincere. Why bother to be actually pure in heart? Who can see the heart after all? The world may speak like that. The world may ridicule such a requirement. But of course, from a biblical perspective, we know that God sees the heart. God knows all the secret things of your heart and mine. And remember in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we are reminded of this solemn truth. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. All hypocrisy will be revealed on that day. And so the pure in heart are blessed, for they shall see God. On the day when, as Paul describes it, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. On that day, the pure in heart will stand before God. Again, as we read in the Psalms, Who shall enter into the presence of God, stand in his holy hill? Only those who are pure in heart. On that day, the pure in heart will stand without fear. They shall see God. That's a marvellous blessing indeed. And then verse 9 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the peacemakers. As others have pointed out, this is a blessing not merely on those who keep the peace. It's not peacekeepers but peacemakers. Nor is this a description of compromisers. There are some who try to keep the peace by accommodating evil, by trying to, to placate it, by doing all they can to avoid conflict and controversy with evil. That's not what is being described here. The peacemakers are not those who ignore evil, the peacemakers are not those who accommodate or tolerate evil. The peacemakers are those who overcome evil. And they overcome evil with good. Again, this is an overflow of God's work in the heart. All we as sinners were at enmity with God. But we have been reconciled through the work of that preeminent peacemaker, the Lord Jesus himself. As Paul describes in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. As Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross between fallen sinners and the holy and righteous God, so also those who have been thus reconciled become peacemakers themselves. Now they have that wisdom that is from above, that James describes as being first pure, then peaceable. They are pure in heart, and they are peacemakers. They have that wisdom from above. Not the wisdom of the world, which is so ready to argue and fight and put others down and promote self. No, cit Christians, citizens of God's kingdom, are called to peace, are called to make peace. As Paul says, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. Be peacemakers. It's that unique spiritual quality of being a peacemaker that leads to these amazing descriptions that we will come to later on in the Sermon on the Mount. For example, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. 
And then also verse 38 of Matthew chapter 5. Ye have heard that it hath been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. This is not merely lying down and, and letting evil have its, have its way, letting evil run rampant without opposing it. But this is dealing with personal slights, personal insults, in such a way as to be peaceable and in such a way as to be a peacemaker. Because when this, when this transformation is evident, it draws men to see the Saviour in us. It points others to Christ, in whom we are able to do these things. And so it makes us peacemakers in that consummate sense, when God uses us as his instruments to reconcile sinners to himself. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the children of God. And once again, this looks forward to the, to the consummation of the last day. As Christians, we are already, in a sense, children of God. As the Apostle John reminds us in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We have already said that Christ, the Son of God, is the preeminent peacemaker. And inasmuch as we are like him, we also are called the children of God. But on that day, when we see him, we will be fully conformed to his image. We will take our place as co-heirs with Christ by the grace of God. We will be called the children of God. Marvelous blessings, all of these. Marvelous descriptions of, of an otherworldly, spiritual character. But now we come to the last of the Beatitudes, in some ways the most startling of all. It deserves special attention. Indeed, it receives special attention here. Three verses devoted to this, verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And this seems immediately surprising. Because you might think such people as have been described, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, you might think such people would at least be tolerated. Yes, we can see how the world might look down on and ridicule and dismiss the poor in spirit, the meek, and so on. But when this inner transformation is manifested in such wonderful qualities as mercy, purity of heart, peacemaking? Where is the harm in that? Why should the merciful be persecuted? Why should the pure in heart be persecuted? Why should the peacemakers be persecuted? But this is where I think the Beatitudes really come home to us. Because all along we have been considering these Beatitudes as descriptions of the character of a kingdom citizen but now, in this last beatitude, we are forced really to confront the reality that the kingdom citizen lives as a stranger in a foreign land. We are forced to realize the truth of the spiritual condition of the world, which spiritual condition we were all partakers of at one point in time. We were like the world. We hated righteousness. And the world now hates righteousness. We must realize this. See what the Lord Jesus himself said in John chapter 3, when he was speaking to Nicodemus. 
John chapter 3 verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Remember, Jesus himself was the perfect embodiment of all these qualities. Jesus was merciful. Jesus was pure in heart. Jesus was the preeminent peacemaker. We saw that already. Was he not persecuted? Look at John chapter 15. John chapter 15 and verse 18. John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hate you, Jesus said to his disciples, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Is it any wonder that Paul wrote to Timothy, All who would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's why the persecution is described here in Matthew chapter 5 as a persecution for righteousness sake. It's not any other kind of persecution. It's not a political persecution. Obviously, it may have a political aspect, but fundamentally, underlying, the underlying cause is spiritual. It is a persecution for righteousness' sake. It is the righteousness of Christ with which the kingdom citizen has been filled and which now overflows and becomes manifest in his character and his, in his dealings with those around him. It is that righteousness of Christ which attracts and provokes the persecution from the world that hates righteousness and hated Christ before it hated us. So the, uh, the otherworldly nature of the kingdom citizen is evident, not just in the difference between his heart and his life and the heart of a worldling and the life of a worldling, but the otherworldly character of the kingdom citizen is evident also in the hostility that he faces on account of this difference because he has the righteousness of Christ and the world hates righteousness because it has none of its own. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Yet this persecution faced by the kingdom citizen is to be considered a blessing. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. By the very fact of not belonging to this world, the very fact of being hated by this world, shows that they are not of this world. It shows that their citizenship is above. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is why they are persecuted by the kingdom of darkness, by these principalities and powers in high places. So important is this that it is repeated again in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 5, this time as a personal address. Notice the change in the pronoun. Blessed are ye. No longer blessed are they, but blessed are ye. This is personal. The Lord Jesus speaks to us personally. Directly, blessed are you, he says, you, Christian, you will be reviled, you will be persecuted, you will be falsely accused. Without ever seeking out persecution, it will come to you, even while you live and act in humility, in meekness, in mercy, in purity, in peaceableness, even while you act in all these virtuous ways, you will be maligned. You will be misrepresented, just as the Lord Jesus was. He was accused of having a devil. He was called a blasphemer. He was charged for being an insurrectionist. All false accusations. So it will be 
for his followers, maligned, misrepresented, falsely accused. It will happen to you. It will happen to me. Yet you and I are to consider ourselves blessed, not for any other reason, but that this is a persecution for righteousness' sake. This is a persecution for Christ's sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. That's the blessing of it. Now again, why is this so important that it has to be repeated? I think because this is where the character of the kingdom citizen is really brought to the test. Remember what the Apostle Peter says, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. For what glory is it if when ye are buffeted, or if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. This is the test. When you live as a kingdom citizen, you do well, and yet you suffer for it. You are righteous, and yet you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. If you take it patiently, then this is acceptable with God. That's the test. That is when we are most sorely tested. Will you be like the seed in the parable of the sower, the seed that fell on the stony ground, that, that appeared to spring up. The word was received apparently with joy. But as soon as the sun rose up and its heat began to blaze, because there was no depth of earth, because the roots did not go down deep, that plant, which seemed so promising, dried up and withered. That that man, that woman was offended by the persecution that came because of the word, because of Christ, and departed from the faith. Will you be like that? Or will you endure? It all comes down to the question of whether we have faith in God's word, whether we have faith in his promises. That's why we are reminded here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, Rejoice! And be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, not on earth. The reward is not on earth. It's in heaven. And we must look to that by faith. We must wait patiently for it by faith. We must wait even joyfully. Because by faith we know that that reward is there. And it will come to us. Persecution becomes even a sign that we belong to Christ, we don't belong to the world. And so we are reminded of the prophets who were before us, who were persecuted also, who took it patiently, and who now enjoy that reward. This is something James also speaks of, in line with this exhortation to patience. First, well, James chapter 5, James chapter 5 and verse 7, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. That's the reward in heaven. Just like a farmer planting the seed and waiting with long patience until the harvest. So the believer, waiting and enduring and toiling, but joyfully, patiently, waiting for that reward. Again, James chapter 5 and verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. They spoke in the name of the Lord. They spoke the truth. They spoke it for the good of the people. And yet they received persecution and affliction for their labors and their efforts. But they took it all patiently. So also should we rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. 
And just as before, so also now, the question for us is this. Will you lead? Will you live? Will you persevere in such a transformed life, even as it begins inevitably to attract persecution from the world in one form or another? Will you persevere only if by faith you cling to God's evaluation of such a one as blessed? Again, we have to note the eschatological bent of all these Beatitudes. All of them point towards that final consummation. The blessings they pronounce all look forward to that day. These are blessings which may not be fully evident now, but by faith we rest secure in the hope that we will one day receive them in fullness. And so with this in mind, you and I ought to examine ourselves before the Lord. Am I merciful? Am I pure in heart? Am I a peacemaker? How do I respond to persecution for righteousness' sake? To persecution for Christ's sake? Am I doing all this by faith in the promise of God? If so, then we can rest in this. No matter what may come our way, the Almighty God of heaven and earth has said we are blessed. Let us live in that hope. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Indeed, you know each one listening to this. You know the persecution, the affliction, the suffering, the trials that we face. You know all these things. Indeed, you have ordained all these things by your sovereign will and decree. Yet we trust in your promise that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to your purpose. We pray that you would remind us of the reward that is waiting for those who are faithful, for those who have fought the good fight, for those who have run the race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We pray that you would work in us because we know we cannot do these things on our own. We pray that you would work in us in such a way that we may live lives that point to the Saviour. We may, by our character as citizens of your kingdom, show the world that there is hope of a better country. We pray that you would use our witness for your glory, for the salvation of souls. We commit all these things into your hands, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake. Amen.